All right. So first, thanks everybody for taking time out to um, join in today. Thanks for having me here. This is very much work in progress and I wish it was further in progress, but uh, you know how the world has been for the last few months. And, um, but I'm excited at least to share with you some of what I've been learning um, and um, to learn from what you have to say. So this paper is, this is you know, really fresh. It's just written for the occasion. And it's really a paper that in a sense I owe as a follow-up on the one that Manuel Gustavo just mentioned that I guess has a link to in the chat. Um, so it's a follow-up in trying to really develop and do something to start to make good on this idea of linguistic function. I guess you better about this. So why do we need the idea? of function or a linguistic or conceptual function in conceptual engineering specifically and in philosophy um, more generally speaking. Well, in conceptual engineering, this has come into play uh, in part because of thoughts that an appeal to function can be used to address the problem of sameness of topic or the limits of revision, right? The problem that was supposed to have been introduced by Strawson back in 1963 and Herman Capellan discusses at length in his recent book. Um, so in my paper that's in the chat on the pragmatic approach to normative conceptual work, I suggest that at least in some cases, appealing to a preservation of sameness of function for say a term like marriage or something like that can play a role in justifying the claim that we haven't changed the subject in a way that matters. Nonetheless, the sort of deeper point that I try to make there is that I don't think we should take the question, when do we have the same topic here with a kind of deep metaphysical seriousness as if we could discover and lay out a number of identity and persistence conditions for sameness of topic that we could try to discover. Instead, I think that's itself a um, term that's open to conceptual engineering. How should we understand sameness of topic? And in most cases, when we're asking about the acceptability of proposed revisions that might come about in conceptual engineering, I think the main issue shouldn't be thought of as a metaphysical issue of whether the concept is the same or has changed, just as the main issue in undertaking revisions, changes in civil engineering shouldn't be whether this is the same building preserved or not, but will it help us meet our goals to make these kinds of changes? So this won't be what I'm focusing on today, but it has to be there in the background because that's part of where the notion of function has come up. Why then do we want a notion of function? Or why do I want a notion of function? Well, in conceptual engineering, I think appeal to function plays a central role. It plays a central role in a kind of reverse engineering project, right? That is, as a precursor to making any proposals for conceptual revision, conceptual elimination, changes in our conceptual scheme, we ought to do some reverse engineering, at least if we're tinkering with our extant conceptual scheme to better judge whether certain concepts should be eliminated, retained, or modified. And that requires asking questions about what functions the concept aims to serve, whether it successfully serves these functions, and whether these sort of stepping back a bit are functions that should be served at all, or if they are in some way insidious that perhaps we hadn't noticed. So all of those kinds of judgments we make in doing reverse engineering require having an understanding of function so we can figure out and assess the functions of our extant terms. When we are doing a kind of constructive conceptual engineering, we also are de novo, as I think it's Dave Chalmers' uh, word, we can also ask these kinds of questions, right? If we're going to be designing a new concept or a set of terms or whatever, then we ought to be, as with other cases of engineering, thinking about their function. What functions do we want them to serve and how can we best construct them to serve them? More importantly for me even, is the idea that the appeal to the function of a linguistic structure or whatever we're talking about, we'll talk about which unit of analysis we should have later, provides certain standards. I mean, there's sometimes a kind of skepticism that I'm sure many of you have encountered, right? That, oh, conceptual engineering, you can just make anything up or it's all just subject to power relations or power constraints, right? So I think it's important to have the idea that there are standards in conceptual engineering. There are better and worse choices of concepts or terminology. 
And that there are ways in which we can evaluate proposals that aren't just arbitrary or subjective or subject to power standards. Now, one sort of common way of wanting to do this by some of my metaphysical colleagues is say, yeah, they're not arbitrary because we can judge which one best carves the world at its joints or maps the metaphysical structure of the world. But this, as I've been arguing at length in my metaphysical work, leads us into deep epistemological obscurity to try to figure out what this metaphysical structure of the world is we're mapping. I think we can do much better, and that's the sort of burden of the prior paper that was in the chat, by trying to give a kind of pragmatic approach to conceptual engineering that appeals to a concept of function as a way of providing standards by which we can evaluate various proposals to modify, eliminate, introduce terms. So that's why I care about it. In philosophy more broadly, the notion of function, the function of an area of discourse or linguistic structures is also essential to areas that we don't normally think of as part of conceptual engineering. It's essential to taking seriously functional pluralist proposals, right? that is, to taking seriously the idea that not all discourse functions representationally. I have, it's one place where you get that idea right on my desk, Hugh Price's lovely book. Um, that is, there have been a wide range of proposals, right, that everybody's familiar with from different areas of alternative functions that different areas of discourse may serve, whether these are expressivist views in moral philosophy, normativist views, like I've just tried to defend in understanding modality, inferentialist views in logic, uh, and so on. So there's a wide range of proposals that say, look, this kind of area of discourse doesn't really serve the function of tracking a certain objects, facts, or properties in the world. It doesn't work the same as discourse about wolves or rivers, right? Now, if we're gonna to try to evaluate those proposals, we'll also need to have some notion of function, have some idea of how to identify linguistic functions so we can see if these proposals are apt or not, right? And of course, it's important to consider these because such alternative functional proposals are often thought to have the potential to dissolve a variety of old epistemological, metaphysical, and methodological problems. Okay, so that's why I think the notion of function is important here, not just for conceptual engineering, but also more broadly. And yet there's also been a certain amount of skepticism about the idea of that there are functions in language or our concepts. And Herman Capellan, I think, puts this most bluntly, perhaps, saying in his 2018 books, a book, I don't think concepts have purposes, and certainly not words and that the appeal to function doesn't do any work for the theorists who appeal to it, particularly what he has in mind there, of course, is doing work in addressing sameness of topic. Oops, sorry, there we go. Um, he considers my suggestion that we look at uh, proper function or system function, which I'll come back to in a minute, and says, well, maybe, but the only real thing stable we can say about what our concepts do is a kind of useless and trivial disquotational statement what they do. So here's a long quote. The reason salmon is useful for us is that it can be used to talk about salmons or denote salmons. The reason freedom is useful is that it can be used to talk about freedom. We care about salmons and freedom and so we have words that enable us to talk about them. However, beyond these disquotationally specified functions, there's variability. We can use freedom in speech acts that have as their aim to undermine freedom or to promote it or discuss it or disparage or make fun of it. There's no limit to what we can go on to do with this term. So what can we mean by function, right? Is there a way of answering this kind of worry and thinking that all we can say is this kind of unhelpful disquotational claim that the function of the um, term or concept F is to pick out the Fs? Well, clearly, uh, Capellan's right about this much. We can't identify the function in these cases with the intended function. Certainly a great proportion probably of our language and concepts aren't intentionally produced by anyone, nor can we identify function with just the ways it is used, right? And this is the same, right? If we're talking about artifacts other than language, normal old artifacts like a penny, right? We can't identify the function of a penny. By the way, it's used, there's a huge amount of variability. Feel free to take these lovely suggestions and do something with them at home. You can make tap shoes with them, you can put a roof on a birdhouse, I think probably I'll use them as screwdrivers. So how should we think about function? Well, so earlier on I suggested there's a couple of alternatives. There's this way of thinking about function as proper function, 
that's been developed, especially by Ruth Milliken, who's interested both in functions of uh, biological items and of artifacts, including language and concepts. And she thinks of function in terms of what are things ancestors did that led to eventually the production of this thing down the reproductive stream, right? Um, in the case of language, what ancestral sort of instances or uses of the term did that led to its preservation and perpetuation in our language or conceptual system. There's also this way of thinking about function that Rob Cummins has articulated of system function, right? But what we wanna do is to look at the system that the thing is embedded in as a whole, say the circulatory system in which the heart is embedded, and ask what role the thing plays in the system of a whole, what it enables the system or those using the system to do that it couldn't do or couldn't do as efficiently or effectively otherwise. Now these aren't rival conceptions of function. Neither of them reduces function to use or to intended function. They're not really rivals. On the contrary, figuring out system function, what it is within a larger system that uh, we can do by having this part, this carburetor or this heart or whatever it may be, is a way of trying to get at what the proper function of it may be, why it's there, why it's been perpetuated, right? And this way of thinking in terms of system function is totally coherent with the use of function in reverse engineering and in archaeology and other areas where it matters, right? So, you know, as, as um, Manuel Gustavo said, I have done a bunch of work on artifacts. This is where I first ran across this work on function. If you are um, a software engineer and you are tasked with discovering the function of a piece of malware that has recently been introduced into a client's computer system, the first thing you'll want to do is to figure out what it does and what it does to the systems in which it's embedded. Right? And that's a way of trying to get at what the function of this malware is. Right? Archaeologists need a notion of function. So it better not be that we just can't say anything sensible about function. Right? They need a notion of function to figure out what the functions are of artifacts they discover. And again, one crucial piece of the puzzle here is um, experimental archaeology where the archeologist will actually try to reconstruct an artifact like the one discovered and see what it does. Can it be used for butchering? Can it survive fire, whatever, as part of a investigation into what its function may have been, where they also wanna look at the larger cultural and social system in which it's embedded. So I was thinking it can't really be that hopeless to get a notion of function. We need it elsewhere in engineering and archeology. span And I thought to myself, surely somebody must have done this for language. There's gotta be some work out there on function and language. So I went to look and before the world closed down, this was literally like the last couple of weeks, I guess in February last year, I spent a couple of happy days in the linguistic stacks at uh, my university's library. Um, and here's some of what I found. Um, oh, there you go, it's nice, actually it's something. First of all, it seems to be useful for thinking of system function to begin by asking about function in language, broadly speaking, rather than starting from the functions of individual words or concepts. So we may be able to get back down to that point in the system function. And again, I thought somebody must have studied this and hurrah, they have. Um, if you take nothing else out of my talk today and say this is work in progress and more emphasis in progress than I'd like, take this. Um, suggestion to investigate some of this work in systemic functional linguistics. I think it's been, tell me in the Q&A if I'm wrong, but it's, it seems to have been very little discovered by philosophers. Um, and it seems to me to be extremely philosophically relevant and interesting. Uh, so part of what I'll be doing today is to be laying out, and I'm no expert in this, like I said, I've just been learning this quite recently on my own in my little office with what I could bring home from the library before the world shut down. Um, but it seems to me, I'll try to show you why I think it's both interesting and philosophically relevant. So here's some of the books that I found. Well, what is systemic functional linguistics, right? Uh, I'm gonna draw on systemic functional linguistics and try as a way of trying to argue that it's not hopeless to look for an account of linguistic function. And one that's not just this kind of trivial, useless, disquotational, um, way of stating functions we saw earlier. And I'll try to show how we can draw on work in systemic functional linguistics to get a start at least on understanding linguistic functions and figuring out how to determine them. And then I'll try to show why the beginnings of an account like this are philosophically interesting and relevant in at least a couple of directions, um, both to conceptual engineering and beyond. Okay, so now what is systemic functional linguistics? <laughs> 
So it's a tradition of linguistics that's been particularly influential in like the Netherlands and in Australia, although it started in the UK um, with the work of Michael Halliday, especially. Um, but then he moved to the University of Sydney. And interestingly, it was at Sydney at the same time, I believe, as Hugh Price and David Armstrong. So one has to imagine a conversation among the three of them. That takes off from the idea that language has evolved in the service of certain functions. So this fits very nicely with the way of thinking about language as a social artifact. They develop a functional grammar, which is based on a functional view of the nature of natural language. A view that is in which natural language is first and foremost regarded as an instrument of social interaction by means of which human beings can communicate with each other. That's the Dutch linguist Simon Dick. Systemic functional linguistics aims to understand linguistic systems in terms of what various linguistic formulations enable us to do that we couldn't do otherwise or couldn't do so efficiently. So it's very much a notion of system function that's at issue here. And it takes off from the idea that understanding linguistic function is gonna be a key to understanding linguistic structure. As Michael Halliday puts it, the internal organization of a natural language can best be explained in the light of the social functions which language has evolved to serve. Language is as it is because of what it has to do. So here function is not understood as the uses to which an individual puts language, which are just too variable to even catalog, right? But rather as something like the objective meaning potential is the technical term they introduced. Contributed by aspects and elements and formulations in language that are there as resources that a speaker in a certain context can take advantage of or not, and which enable speakers to do things with language that they couldn't otherwise do. Characteristically more than one thing at a time, characteristically three things at a time as we'll come to, three kinds of things. But the, before we come to adult language, right, the easiest way to start to understand linguistic function as the people in systemic functional linguistics emphasize is by studying language development or language development. Um, so how this is the functional origin of language is most evident in the language of young children. Why? they're functionally much simpler. Whereas each utterance of an adult language typically serves three functions, macro functions, which we'll talk about. It's characteristic of the utterances of the very young child that they're functionally simple. Each utterance serves just one function. In a young child's language, the internal form of the utterance reflects rather directly the function it's being used to serve. So what can a child do, a young child? We're talking here about toddlers, right? First initial language learners, right? that they couldn't do or couldn't do so effectively otherwise without learning language. Well, Halliday identifies six functions that are used in this kind of initial stage of language learning. There's the instrumental function where language is used and at this stage the functions and uses do somewhat go together. Language is used to satisfy material needs to get goods or services. So the child can holler for milk and now get milk much more effectively than if they just screamed and their caregiver had to guess what they wanted. They also use it in a regulatory way to control the behavior of others. So the child can now say, mama come, right? And hopefully acquire the presence of the person they want, right? In ways again, that would have been more difficult with just a holler. They also used interactionally and some children learn this first, right? The way the hi, the bye-bye, um, greeting others. The personal use where language is used to express the child's personal feelings of interest, pleasure, disgust, and so forth, like yuck. Yay, and oops, right? The heuristic, when language is used to investigate the environment, and you can see toddlers, especially around 18 months, though it varies, right, repeatedly interacting with their caregivers to try to get new words for things, right? My nephew used to always say this, 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 pointing at different things and trying to get the names for them. And there's the imaginative function, language used in play and pretense, what Halliday calls the let's pretend function. Somewhat later, as a development, how they also identifies the seventh function that comes after the others, the informative or representational function in which language is used to communicate information about the world to someone who's thought not to know. So it's only at that stage that the child, rather than pointing at something in the environment, can tell their grown-ups what happened at school today, right, when they're no longer there. And this is the informational or representational function. One way of getting at function, what having language enables us to do that we couldn't do others, is to ask what happens when it's missing. 
right? What's a child missing, a, a toddler, let's say, who doesn't yet acquire language, who has a language delay or a language disability, right? What they're missing isn't so much an ability to state truths about the world. What they're really missing that the developmental um, linguists worry about is an ability to make their needs known and to control their world. And that's what leads typically to characteristic what adults classify as behavioral problems that make difficulties for the child and for their caregivers and teachers and so on. Right? That's what the speech therapists intervene to help fix. So that already suggests that the, even in this very early stage, sort of on the face of it, language has a number of functions other than just, and our words have a number of functions, other than just to pick out the Fs. F functions that pick out the Fs, right? The function of learning new words is not typically, at least, merely disquotational, the, where the function of S is to pick out the Fs. You might think that's playing a central role in the function of dog, or these terms that are used with the heuristic function. That's fair enough. We'll say more about those in a minute. But what about the function of yuck is to pick out the yucky stuff? Maybe. The function of oops is to pick out the oopsies? The function of highs to pick out the highs? Right, the further you go, the more you see that this kind of way of thinking about function is going to be at best sort of minimally relevant to a, a real subclass of cases. Now, this mistake of thinking of all language in these kinds of representational terms, this is interesting to discover for me in Halliday, because I've seen people like uh, Hugh Price rail against this sort of representationalism in philosophy, but Halliday makes the case that this isn't just philosophical, he hasn't really ever mentioned philosophy that I've noticed. Um, but that it's a common mistake of adults, that adults tend to think of language just in these representational or informational terms, even though that's only a very minor portion of the functions that it serves for the child, doesn't match the child's understanding of language at all. And even for adults, it may not be dominant, though it comes to dominate the adult's conception of the use of language. This is a characteristic view. Well, you might say, well, do at least some terms, maybe our, what the, these linguists would call congruent nouns, like dog and wolf and so on, function to pick out the Fs. Can we have this, this quotational view of function there? Well, it certainly plays a role, right? I think we have to think about it a little differently. Again, as Halliday puts it, the main function of learning new words at around 18 months is learning about the environment. New words function mainly as a means of categorizing observed phenomena. So you word, use the, learn the word dog, you can pick out the dogs, and you can go on to investigate and learn more about the dogs. Vocabulary expands through its use in this heuristic or methodic or learning function, especially for introducing names for things that are prominent or familiar. But that's that even there, that's not all they enable the child to do, right? Once the child acquires the word dog, right, the child can go on to use it with a heuristic function, pick out and investigate the dogs, right? But the child can do other things too that they wouldn't be able to do or do so readily. Otherwise, they can greet the dog. Hi, doggy. They can command the dog, right? Doggy come, doggy sit. They can make commands about the dog. They can ask the parent to bring them the dog, right? Or bring them the toy dog. They can engage and pretend about the dog and many other things. So again, this kind of picking out function is only a very uh, minor part of the story, a very small part of the story. So let's think more, and this is really me, not the linguists um, directly, to think about what a child can do by learning new congruent nouns acquired in observational context. So a congruent noun is, in their terminology, one that's used to pick out basically an environmental object, right? Learned in context typically of observation. So it does indeed enable us to pick out the X's, to track and file information and share information with others about the X's and to inquire further about the X's. This is all important functions of acquiring this kind of vocabulary. It also enables us to form generalizations about the X's and maybe eventually, if we go on to study them scientifically, formulate laws or maybe proto laws. That's all kind of the descriptive side. There's also a kind of impositional or normative side. And I sort of marked that difference by putting these in purple. Um, you can also do things like impose differential norms on our responses to them or on our behavior. So you can teach the child, not only these are the raspberries, those are the crotons, those are the skunks, but to pick the raspberries, but not the blackberries, they're not ready yet. To not touch the crotons, because they're poisonous. To avoid the skunks, right? And this is another really important part of the function of learning these kinds of terms, to impose these kinds of differential norms. You can also do other things like request, demand, greet, express feelings about, and pretend about the X's, whatever they may be.
So in my um, new role as remote learning instructor, I learned a couple of new words this fall that came to mind. Maybe you knew them already. So my daughter's second grade class has been going to the stream to do some outdoor education. And while I was there, I learned a new word, maybe some of you knew it, I didn't. Water penny, there's a water penny. As you can see, they're kind of hard to detect even in the water. I never even noticed such things. But now having learned the word water penny, I could go on to not just identify and pick out the water pennies, but to share information with the second graders down the stream about where the water pennies are found and what sort of habitat, how numerous they are and so on, right? And then we could go on to investigate further these aspects of water pennies. Another word I learned was snot rocket. You'll be glad that I have not provided you a picture of a, of a snot rocket. Again, maybe some of you knew this word. I did not. This appeared only once in material for um, cross-country skiing practices with this phrase, snot rockets are prohibited. So in that case, in the first case, water penny, right? It's used mainly with this kind of informational function to acquire more information about the water pennies. In the snot rocket, it's used mainly with this kind of normative function. Don't do it, right? You can kind of roughly figure out what it might be by the terms. I'm not looking any further. All right. Some of them go both ways, right? So girl is a term that children acquire observationally, right? Um, you can use it to track the girls, um, but it's also used normatively, right? You also learn norms, and these are not just sort of external norms of how we treat the girls, but also internal of how the girls are to act. You're, for example, to choose a, a fairly um, superficial one, to use this bathroom and not that, right? And the kid learns that pretty soon. To go to this section of the toy store and not that one and so on, right? So I think it's important to notice that even for these kind of congruent nouns, it's not rock is not exactly congruent, but it was too good an example to leave out. Um, even for these congruent nouns that are observationally acquired, um, the, the functions aren't just picking out the X's and inquiring about them. And that's important for conceptual engineering in ways that I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, they can be useful for tracking, filing, and showing information, for forming generalizations and laws. And of course, in each of these contexts, they may be more or less successful, right? We may engage in conceptual revision, like changing the way we use fish so we're not picking out whales with it anymore in order to get better generalizations, as Carnap emphasized, for example. We may find that terms that look like they're supposed to serve this role, like race terms, don't actually serve to make scientifically acceptable generalizations, right? Well confirmed generalizations. And then we can engage in critique. But they also enable us to impose internal and external norms, commands. Um, and these can be helpful, like don't touch the crotons because they're poisonous, stay away from the skunks, um, justified by the internal characteristics of your crotons or your skunks, or they may be not, right? And once we see these kinds of functions, we're in a better situation in conceptual engineering to lay them bare and to open them for assessment and possibly critique, right? If we find that the relevant norms, that this term isn't really useful for forming many generalizations, it's heavily used for imposing norms, we can't see a good justification for those norms. All these diverse functions should be considered in conceptual engineering. And thinking of function just as the function of F is to pick out the Fs, sort of hide some of that from view for us. All right, let's move on. That was sort of just early childhood language. Let's talk about functions in mature or adult language. Um, so here's what's distinctive about the language of typical grown-ups. As Halliday puts it, every linguistic act with a few broadly specifiable exceptions, probably things like greetings, is serving more than one function at once. Linguistic form or grammar allows for meanings which derive from different functions to be encoded together as integrated structures so that every expression becomes in principle functionally complex. Grammar makes it possible to mean more than one thing at a time. Typically there's three, what they call macro functions that are served by each piece of text in a mature language. There's the ideational macro function. This is what philosophers tend to focus on, of encoding a certain kind of propositional content, information about the world or the speaker's experience. But there's also this interpersonal macro function that shows the speaker's relation to the listener or reader, like questioner or answerer or commander and receiver of command. And also enables the speaker to intrude into the speech situation in various ways, making evident their attitudes, judgments, level of certainty, and so on. This gets carried in English by things like mood, indicative, imperative, and derogative, and modality, more on that later. Then there's also the textual macro function, which organizes the text as a piece of writing or speech 
making evident how what we're saying hangs together and what the theme and relations of ideas are. It's only this, these functions that enable us to have texts instead of just words at all. So part of the idea here is that in a mature language, a speaker has a whole network of options and they map these out in kind of flow charts that are very complicated. Um, and we can ask why a speaker would choose one set of options rather than the other, perhaps to encode the same or more or less the same ideational content. Why make this choice of words rather than the other? And we can engage in that kind of contrastive explanation and try to address questions about what the chosen mode of expression enables speakers to do. So here's a, an easy example, I hope. So imagine a setting where you've got a speaker, she wants milk for her tea, all right? Now again, a child in early language can use language to get it. They can holler milk, right? Or maybe milk with a rising tone, milk, um, as a way of trying to get the milk. But a grown up has options. So imagine this conversational interaction. The tea is brought. The speaker says, is it a black tea? Interlocutor says, yes. Now she's got options, right, the speaker. You can say, give me milk and utter a command. You can say, I want milk, right? In the first, you're establishing your, your relation to the speaker as someone who's entitled to command the speaker around. We're unlikely to do that, most of us, in most social situations. You can avoid that implication by just saying, I want milk, and speaking of yourself, rather than making it look like you can command the person, it's still a bit blunt. Or you can put it even more politely by using an interrogative form. Do you have some milk, for example? Or you could say something like this. Is it black tea? Yes, then I would like some milk for it, right? And now what you've done is introduced a textual element that shows the relationship, right? That shows your speaker that it's because it's black tea that you'd like milk for it, that if it was a herbal tea, you, you wouldn't particularly care. Um, perhaps also excusing yourself from having asked before. You introduce a modal, right? Which again, sort of reduces the uh, implication of a differential power relationship that you're entitled to command this person. And you've still got this sort of ideational content here of um, that you want some milk. So this is just a, a very simple way of, of trying to see how these three macro textual functions can be served by even a single simple phrase in context. Now, what can we say about functions that's philosophically interesting here? I'm just going to give you a few sort of glimpses of stuff that I found that I think is super interesting and relevant and things I care about in philosophy. Um, grammatical metaphors and modal constructions. This will be way too brief, but let me try. Okay, so as I've already sort of implied in early language development, and also evolutionarily, and the people in linguistics have done this kind of historical work, uh, across languages, where you start is with congruent terms acquired in response to observations of interest in the environment. We have noun terms for things. We have verb terms for processes like run, jump, and so on. Maybe adjectives for qualities and so on. And so in early language, you can say things like man, clean, car. You've got this transitive construction with congruent nouns, clean for the, the verb, clean for the uh, process, man and car for the things. But as you get more sophisticated with language, you can introduce grammatical metaphors and they tend to get introduced across languages, right? Um, a grammatical metaphor, this is a little bit of a bad term from my point of view, but I'm just gonna roll with it because it's, it's their term. I don't think these should be understood as merely metaphorical. We could talk about why they say that, but I'm gonna use their term. In these situations, a meaning that was originally construed by one kind of wording comes instead to be construed by another. We have a, a sort of, um, the grammatical category shift that goes on. So we can move from saying man washed car to saying the man gave the car a good wash, wash now being a noun, right? We can go on to say things about the car wash. The car wash was a very messy enterprise, for example, by introducing this noun, noun term for a process. Now you can have shifts, the, the most typical ones seem to be nominalizations, but they can go with any category. So you can shift from an adjective to a noun. You can move from saying the barn is red to the barn has the property of redness, for example, or from she bathed to she took a bath, um, from the verb now to the nominalized form. But it doesn't even always involve nominalization. Interestingly, they also identify talk of causation as grammatical metaphor. So you start in the simpler, Formulation by saying something like the boy added gasoline to the fire, so it spread. But then you can introduce a grammatical metaphor and say adding gasoline caused the fire to spread. 
Now, what functions do these grammatical metaphors serve? They might just look redundant in some contexts. If we just want to say the barn has the property of redness, that just sounds like a wordier way, at first at least, of saying the barn is red. But the primary motivation for nominalization is a functional one, Suzanne Eggins puts it. By nominalizing, we're able to do things with the text that we can't do in an unnominalized text. So if we move from saying she bathes to saying she took a bath, then we can also say things like she had a relaxing hot bath. Very hard to say that with just the verb form of bathe. She bathed in hot water and found it very relaxing. It's much wordier and doesn't quite carry exactly the same sense either. You can also engage in causal claims like her bath caused the flood on the ground floor. You can move also from they dance to they did a dance. And then you can say more things about the dance. They did this well-known Romanian folk dance. Hard to know how to do that with just dance as a verb. And you can also go on to count the dances, right? The act after intermission includes three folk dances, you might be able to say. So with grammatical metaphors, we can quali qualify and quantify processes and events in ways that would be difficult or impossible without undertaking this kind of grammatical shift. That enables us to form texts with greater lexical density, that is a higher proportion of content carrying words, it's sort of condensed. It also enables us to organize texts rhetorically, putting the focus on different pieces of information and enabling those who are writing to experts to sort of pick up where they left off in their exposition. So if you have a physics textbook, for example, you can go on for a long time explaining the ways in which the spin fluctuates but then go back instead of restating it on say, speak of the random fluctuations in the spin components of one of the two particles do such and such and have a much better chance of conveying this theoretical information. Here's a simple case that I came upon last week in my own house of introducing grammatical metaphor to show how they enable simplification and theory construction, right? So my, my little daughter who's eight and me were playing snap circuits together. And here's what we discovered. If you put the plus side of the battery to the minus side of the motor, the fan spins clockwise. If you put the minus side of the battery to the plus side of the motor, the fan spins clockwise. If you put the minus to the minus or the plus to the plus, it spins counterclockwise and it flies off. That's the cool bit, right? Um, all this complicated information, right? We can put much more succinctly if we introduce a new noun term, polarity. And now we can say connections with the same polarity spin counterclockwise, connections with the opposite polarity spin clockwise, right? So that's just a little illustration to see how introducing these grammatical metaphors enables us to increase in lexical density and to construct theories. Indeed, the development of grammatical metaphors, this is super interesting to me, seems to represent tendencies common to the elaborated discourse of science and technology, government and bureaucracy, in all languages, and I gotta leave to linguists to do that kind of historical and cross-cultural study. But what they've shown is that the proportion of a text that involves grammatical metaphor goes dramatically up when you have in a certain culture, the development of science, technology, and interestingly, bureaucracy. So Halliday has, for example, drawn out evidence that grammatical metaphors were also in ancient Greek and Chinese and Sanskrit where this metaphoric shift from the clausal to the nominal construal of experience came in each of these cases with a sort of explosion of scientific discourse. It's no exaggeration to say that grammatical metaphors are the foundation of all scientific thought. You cannot construct a theory without exploiting the power of the grammar to create new virtual phenomena by using metaphoric strategies of this kind. Okay, so let's summarize, right? What are functions of grammatical metaphors we've seen? They enable us to quantify and qualify processes, events, and attributes. They also make quantities measurable. So instead of saying, you know, the, the milk is hot, we could say the milk has a temperature of 175 degrees or something like that, right? Um, increase lexical density, organize text rhetorically, showing connections among ideas and enabling us to formulate lengthy arguments, enabling the construction of theories, also expanding expressive power in ways that doesn't always enable us, don't always enable us to eliminate them and sort of unpack them back into non-metaphorical texts once they're there. And this meshes nicely with some work in, uh, say, philosophy of math, about ways in which um, now discourse for numbers enables us to add expressive power to the language. They also, interestingly, and again, I think we have this kind of responsive to the world side and the imposing on the world side, 
which I've distinguished handily with um, purple letters, um, but they enable us to organize and run bureaucracy. So we have this huge increase in nominalization. Here's my favorite one, right? Uh, from my time in the UK, bill posters will be prosecuted, right? So we've introduced a new uh, noun term here, bill posters, right? And you might be able to see that it says on the bottom, bill posters is innocent, right? As a way of then going on to enable us to say that bill posters will be prosecuted and will be treated in the following way and so on. You can do the same with talking about homeowners will receive a tax reduction, taxpayers are obligated to the following um, duties and so on, right? So it's all over the place in bureaucracy too, which is on the normative and positional side of things. Lessons from this then, what we can get so far. We shouldn't begin, I think, by asking about the functions of concepts. And I think this is the point, if I remember correctly, I haven't gone back to look at it, that um, you know, it was behind Frege's worries about the concept horse, right? Because we want to talk about the concept of redness, for example, we've got to use the noun form. But the noun form of redness might have functions that are distinct from the adjectival form of red, is red, right? And we'll ally those if we only talk about functions of concepts. So then we go with language. Um, and we can also, I think, do better by sort of starting at the system level and asking them first about the functions that are served by being able to form grammatical metaphors as part of a total linguistic system, where there's textual functions as well as ideational functions to be served. Now, I don't mean to suggest that this is all that can be said about any grammatical metaphors. This is a starting place. This is something that all grammatical metaphors have in common in terms of their ability to add to the meaning potential. We might still have a lot more particularly to say about particular grammatical metaphors that we care about. Because here's the interesting thing, right? Once you start to think about it, most of our philosophically interesting terms involve grammatical metaphor. Talk about properties, processes, events, possibilities, thoughts, numbers, causes, time, mind, knowledge, truth, meaning. These are all grammatical metaphors. And I'm sure a great deal more can be said by the experts on those particular uh, areas about what other functions they serve, but we have to start by at least acknowledging these general roles played by grammatical metaphors. And we should consider all of these functions before we would, oops. Eh. Eh. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, before we would consider any proposals for eliminating or revising the term, for being eliminativist about mental vocabulary or modal vocabulary. Um, or whatever, we should at least lay these other functions on the table and consider them. There you go. Here's another interesting feature, right? Wherever it occurs, grammatical metaphor involves risk of puzzles, paradoxes, and category mistakes. So what you've got is fundamentally a category shift, right? So here's again a sort of everyday one that Halliday brings out. You could be describing a famous um, mountain climbing expedition and say they reached the summit on the fifth day, but if you wish to make it dramatic and show the changes from day to day, uh, you could instead prioritize this and say the fifth day saw them at the summit, introducing a grammatical metaphor. But of course, there you've already introduced a category mistake because days can't see, right? Not one that's liable to leave us philosophically astray, but then you do start to wonder about some of the problems that arise with these philosophically interesting terms. Because some of the puzzles just might be dissolved or at least show up differently if we see the roles of these terms properly and their introduction roles. Many of these puzzles might arise by taking congruent nouns observationally introduced like dog as our model and expecting all terms to work in the same way. When we ask them, go on to ask questions like, well, how can universals be in two places at the same time? A dog can't be. What sorts of things could meanings possibly be? How can we come to know moral or modal facts if we can't observe them and so on? Various of these puzzles might arise or be exacerbated by taking congruent observationally introduced nouns as a model and not noticing the different ways in which language functions when we introduce grammatical metaphors. I said a little bit about modality. Yeah, okay, I'll try to do it quickly. Um, so again, there's questions that often arise right, about whether we should eliminate modal talk. Does it just lead us astray into talking about merely possible fat men in the doorway or about things like possible worlds that are just gonna be a mess and we don't want to admit them to our ontology. So we should just have a, a purely extensional language, for example. Well, again, before you consider such proposals, you should do some reverse engineering and ask things about what functions modal discourse serves as part of a total linguistic system. And that was super complicated. <laughs> 
Um, here's the beginnings of what systemic functional linguistics has to say about what Jenny Gajus I'm not saying I'm going to take it over word for word, but let's get started with it. A modal system on their analysis provides ways in which a language user can intrude on her message, expressing attitudes and judgments of various kinds. And so while the grammatical metaphors really help us serve these textual functions, the modal system really helps us especially to serve these interpersonal macro functions, including things like, say, um, judgments of likelihood, sort of conveying how likely you think something is, um, or expressions of your expectations in uttering epistemic modals, conveying your attitudes or demands when you use deontic modals. Here's an example, right? Suppose you find an old manuscript somewhere and you think the book was written by Charlotte Bronte. You could just say it, this book was written by Charlotte Bronte. But if you're hesitant, if you're not sure, you can convey that in a number of ways. Again, you've got this network of options. You could use a mood adjunct and say, I think the book was written by Charlotte Bronte. But if you don't want to refer to yourself and make it look like just your personal subjective opinion, right, then you can instead use a modal adjunct and say, the book might have been written by Charlotte Bronte, right? That's why we might use that formulation rather than this or this. You can also go on to nominalize that modal form, if you like. Suppose you're arguing with somebody about whether it was written by Bronte or Thackeray. You can introduce a nominalized modal form and say, the possibility that it was written by Charlotte Bronte is far greater than the possibility that it was written by William Thackeray, right? Now enabling us to compare possibilities in a way you can't if you just use the might construction or I think you think, right? That's useful, that's interesting. Similarly for deontic modals, right? Imagine you're writing a syllabus, right? You could say to your students, write a discussion post every week, uttering it as an imperative. Or you could introduce a modal verb and say, students must write a discussion post every week. Now I'm softening it. I'm not putting myself in a position to be like your army commander barking commands at you. I'm inserting this modal verb that carries that with a different interpersonal relationship. I can also go on to nominalize from that modal claim and say, it's a requirement of the course that students write a discussion post every week. Now I'm not in the picture at all, right? I'm just telling you what the requirements of the course are. There they are out there. Right? And that has extra advantages because we can go on to say things about this requirement. We can say fulfilling this requirement is worth one third of your class grade, right? Which you can't say if you're just saying write a discussion post. Um, this requirement may be waived for students who do a presentation or quantify requirements. This is one of the three requirements for the class. All useful ways. So modality, it's super complicated. Right. There's all sorts of modals we haven't talked about here, logical necessities, metaphysical necessities, ones that I've cared about, and so on. There's a ton to say about it in linguistics and in philosophy. I don't pretend that this is a theory, this is a pointer. Um, this barely scratches the surface. But we can at least draw out a couple of lessons already. One is we shouldn't be tempted by any proposal to eliminate modal discourse on grounds of the metaphysical obscurity of modal features without doing some reverse engineering first and being clear about the various functions that modal discourse serves. We can also see that it would be a mistake to think that all we can say about function here is the function of possibility is to pick out the possibilities. The function of requirement is to pick out the requirements. There's a lot that's left off stage here. Instead of asking these questions and then can we make sense of what our properties, in, in each case, instead of beginning by asking what are properties, numbers, moral facts, or possible worlds, and so on, we should begin by taking a step back and asking what functions are served by these ways of speaking as part of a total linguistic system. How do they differ from congruent observationally acquired terms in their rules, in their function? How do they contribute to the total meaning potential of a linguistic system? Keeping an eye not just on the ideational functions, but also on the textual and interpersonal macro functions. And this then, starting our line of questioning this way, will also open the way to properly considering functional pluralist proposals, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. That is, it'll enable us to take seriously views that the relevant terms don't aim to track observed features of the world, but instead are introduced by other methods to enable us to do other things. There's a range of things they might do. Okay, so why should we think about function, just to conclude now? Well, as I've suggested, mostly elsewhere, we need a good understanding of function for 
reverse engineering before we evaluate any revisionary or eliminative proposals. We need to ask what functions are served by this range of terminology, this grammatical enablement, et cetera, or what functions are supposed to be served by it, right? If we have a term that's introduced in scientific discourse, say, as a tracking term. Then we can use that to get at least a certain range of standards for our conceptual engineering projects and proposals. We can try to evaluate how well the term fulfills its function, how we, how we do them with fish when we apply it to whale, right? I'm rereading Moby Dick now, it's not going so well. Um, we can also evaluate whether those are functions that we should support if the primary function, say, of gender terms or race norms, race terms has been to impose and enforce norms more than to track things scientifically and norms that we don't think are justified by the features of the um, people to whom they apply, then we got grounds for critique going on, right? We can also use an account of function to better understand and evaluate functional pluralist proposals wherever they arise, whether we're talking about expressivist views in ethics, normativist views in modality, inferentialist views in logic, or whatever, we can now uh, have better grounds to examine them. How should we not think about function? Right? Well, a couple of things uh, that I, at least I've gotten out of doing this work and um, reading this work in systemic functional linguistics um, is we shouldn't begin by just asking about the functions of an individual concept. Again, that sort of falsifies it by sticking us in a particular grammatical category. Um, I think even although I speak this way sometimes and I have spoken this way, we've got to worry about speaking about functions of an area of discourse because say a modal operator might have very different functions than a um, nominalized term for a modal like possibility or possible world and so on. And we want to keep those distinctions in mind. We also, I think, shouldn't really start at the individual level at all, as I've suggested, but start at the systemic level, look at the kinds of macro functions um, served by mature language in general, and how these different formulations, abilities to construct and so on can help us. And we certainly shouldn't rest content with the idea that all we can say about function is disquotational. How should we think about function? We should begin at the system level, I think, asking about the functions of a linguistic system, and then we can inquire further about what roles within that system different constructions uh, enable us to fulfill. And we're not alone here, at least, right? We can make use of empirical work in systemic functional linguistics. We're not just stuck having to make stuff up from the ground up. Um, then we can ask what various linguistic structures within that system enable speakers to do. And again, we can, as we think about function, we must be careful to attend to the contribution that various elements may make to all three macro functions. So understood, I hope to really made the case that working on linguistic function isn't hopeless. Getting a decent account of linguistic function isn't hopeless. We can get help from empirical work in linguistics. And we shouldn't think that the most that can be said is disquotational. There's a whole lot more that can be said and what more we can say really matters for our work in conceptual engineering and beyond that for other work in philosophy. It not only enables us to better assess proposals in conceptual engineering, but also to better consider and evaluate, for example, functional pluralist proposals wherever they appear. And that's it.